Uh, it's been quite some time as we have, have navigated through these 22 chapters, but if you've been here for a, a, a bulk of this, maybe not every study, but if you've been here for a bulk of this, you should be able to navigate your way through the book of Revelation now. Uh, I have, uh, have taught you guys this in, in such an easy to understand format, in such an easy to understand way. Uh, that hopefully with your Bible notes and whatever you have scribbled down, that you're able to take these things away and, and to look at the book of Revelation, not with fear, but with great understanding and realizing what God desires for you and for I as we get the revelation of Jesus Christ, as we understand uh, the, the, the prophecy that is laid out here and that which lies ahead. It is absolutely beautiful. It's amazing. And so if you're, if you're putting a title on your message here tonight, it's a very simple one, the final message, and that's really what this is all about. It is the final words. It is the last of the last of the last in here, um, and we're we're gonna move through it. And um, you know, tonight I'm I'm gonna uh, why we will get through the whole chapter. Um, I'm gonna touch uh, maybe just very slowly and just talk about you know maybe the first handful of verses or so, and then we'll pick it up a little bit. Uh, and, and, and then we'll, um, we'll close it down with a final application, total, total book application here before we go our way tonight. And so let's dive into it this way. Chapter 22, let's, let's, uh, let's capture the overview first of what we're looking at in this chapter. Uh, this particular chapter, we've got three movements, okay? There's three particular topics that we're going to come across within this. Uh, we've got the continuation of the description of paradise that's, that's being uh, brought forward by John here in verses one through five, and so we'll see that. Um, you know, we'll 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 watch him give the final portions uh, of what that looks like here. Uh, second idea behind this is that we have the final message from Jesus. You know, that is probably the bulk of this chapter, uh, verses six down through nineteen, and we'll move across these these verses as well, uh, and then we go away with this. Uh, final exhortation, final word of encouragement, final focus point here for all of us. Uh, we're going to learn a new word, an Aramaic word, when we get here to, to verse 21. Uh, but we, we see the last promise from Jesus in verse 20 and 21. And so that gives us the overview of this chapter. And so I'm so thankful. Uh, some of the chapters that we've gone through have had, you know, five, six different movements through the course of the chapter. And it's been very difficult you know, to do it in, in one setting with all those movements. And so this one, there's only three. It shouldn't be bad. We should be able to make this. And so uh, before we continue, though, I want to make sure that maybe I can make this statement uh, just right up front so that we can, we can capture the right heartbeat for ourselves. And that is this. The big takeaway is finish strong. Finish strong. We're here in this, this final chapter here, Revelation, and, and what we're going to see Jesus give to John by way of his angels, that he is coming quickly. And, and when we opened up Revelation, we, we looked at chapter 1, verse number 1, and, 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 and we saw the um, admonition that when, when we see certain things begin to happen, we learned that these things were going to take place quickly. And we, we looked at that Greek word, intaki, it's pronounced something like that. And, and, and we realized that it's all about, if we could get the tone or the, the flavor of the word, it was all about when you begin to see certain elements happen, just realize that they're going to ramp up really fast. And, and, and we've learned through the course of this study, uh, and we've, we've seen it as we've walked through real time over the course of, the, of this last year and a half of wrestling with the dynamics of a changing country that we live in. And some of this stuff has gotten us supercharged. We've seen yet another war, right, that has taken place in more recent days uh, over in Israel. And we know that Israel is indeed uh, the timepiece uh, that the Lord uses for all the stuff that's going on throughout the, the globe. And so the admonition to the church, be it this fellowship or any other fellowship around the globe is, is, is listen, we want to finish strong. And, and, and we're living in a time, specifically here in America, where it is easy to do everything else except for finish strong with Jesus. The stuff that is going on in, in, in our world and the convenience and the comforts, that's specifically what I'm talking about, is that Satan has a way to dilute the heart of man. And, and, and when we walk in the convenience and the comforts, 
Sometimes we are not as sharp and we're not, we're, we're, we're not there in, in this strong dependency upon the Lord, but rather we get a little bit flabby and lazy in our walk with the Lord. But what we have seen from this prophecy, 22 chapters now of what we're looking at, that, 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 that God has given this to the church, AD 95 when John received this, <clears throat> When the church was going through that time of, of difficulty and they were still seeing that pressure and that persecution and everything. And man, when you're under pressure, when you're under persecution, there is a, there, there's just something that God uses to bring us right to that place of dependency and remaining broken and remaining close. But when the pressure comes off so frequently, what we do is we, we, we drift back a little bit. If we take anything out of Revelation, if we, if we can understand anything from this, realize that the eminency of the return of Jesus Christ, it's eminent. He can, it can happen at any second in time, literally any second in time. And, 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 and teaching the eminence coming through this book, may you and I take that to heart that we finish strong, that we finish better than what we started, that we don't just come to Jesus and then, well, that's as far as I'm going to go. I'm saved. I got my life insurance. I'm moving right on. No, 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 no. May we have an intensity to learn of Jesus, to follow Jesus, to stay close to Jesus and watch God do things, radical things in us and through us. And so I want to challenge you here. Uh, we're coming up to summer and, and at, the, at the time of summer, church attendance always gets soft. I want to encourage you guys here in this fellowship and for those folks that have recently just joined us, we've had a number of folks that recently joined us uh, from online. It just happened like all of a sudden. Folks were, were watching online, watching online, watching online, and we, uh, well, goodness gracious, half of what happened here on Sunday with the baptism of all these people, right? Half of those folks came from online that we've never seen before, right? They only showed only a couple, uh, let me rephrase this, they've only been with us for a couple weeks in, this, in the physical place, but they've been here for a much longer span of time of watching online. And so, man, I'm rejoicing for that, that online uh, broadcast thing, but man, may we finish Finish, finish strong. And so, <clears throat> moving forward. Um, last week, what did we look at? We looked at the eternal state and, and what the Bible shares about the new heaven and the new earth. And so, uh, as, as John got that HSD, that Holy Spirit download, right? The angel was communicating to him and, and sharing with him. And, and we, you know, we, we, we saw new Jerusalem, the new heaven, new earth, and all of this. We got the measurements and everything. And, and we defined what that meant to us on a very practical level here as a church looking forward. And, and if you missed the message, feel free to go back and take a peek at it. But as we go here into today, John, what does he do? Well, he opens up and he continues with dealing with the eternal state, with the new heaven, the new earth, under the, that banner of the theme of what he's been working through. And uh, quite honestly, you know, I'm not the guy that put these chapters and verses in here, but I think they missed the marker a little bit on this one. I think they should have included the next five verses Back in chapter 21, it would have been so nice because we read our Bibles and we get to a chapter break and we think, well, we're on a new subject now. I'm in a different chapter. And that's, that's really, it's not the case. And so uh, as we look at this, we come to our very first idea of the night and that is a description of paradise continued. And so um, look at verse number one with me. Revelation 22 verse one, he says this. He says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. And so we find here in this description of paradise, we find that he, the first thing that we see is, is water of life. Now we learned last week that in uh, the new heaven, or excuse me, the new earth, that there's not going to be any sea, okay? That this, uh, the, the, the climatic, climatic, not climax, but climatic, is that a word, right? Like dealing with the climate? Is somebody smart in here say yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. We'll take it and roll with it. I believe you. So see, you're my fact finders or my fact checkers, okay? Those climatic conditions around the way that our atmosphere is balanced out and maintained, right? We got, um, you know, we've got uh, 71% of the, uh, the mass upon our globe is that of water. Incredible. And yet in the new earth, that it's not going to be a sea, but there is water. Now, in Psalm 46 and 4, a favorite psalm of mine, that the psalmist, he says this, he says, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. We know that, that in 
the days ahead, the new heaven, the new earth, and, and, and we got this description of Jerusalem, which is where uh, historically going back into the Old Testament, even today, we know that people go up to Jerusalem to worship God. And, 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 and the point behind all of this is that God is going to be once again in that place, face to face, where his followers will see him face to face and, and be able to worship in that capacity. And this river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. He says that there was a river of water of life. I like that because we're going to see that there's water of life. We're going to see in verse 2 there's a tree of life. We're going to see even that as we, we get down farther than that, we're going to see that, that even the illumination of Jesus, that you know he's the light of the world, right? And, and even here in this, there is no nighttime because his very presence illuminates everything. There's no night. It's, it's constantly lit up. And, and, and it's lit up in such a way, not coming from the sun, but coming from his glory. And, and man, when I think about all of that, it just blows my mind. I, I mean, I don't even know how to wrap my mind around all of that stuff, but hey, it's here in the word. You know, an, an, another interesting thing I love to, to talk about when we start talking about the water of life is in the gospel of John, the gospel of John in chapter seven, that, that we find Jesus here that he is... He's speaking. He's speaking in a prophetic capacity here regarding uh, the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the promise of the Father to give the Holy Spirit. And he says this. He says, uh, John 7 and 37, he says, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You know, that overflow of the Holy Spirit. Again, he's speaking in a prophetic way because the Holy Spirit, we know he doesn't fall until Acts chapter uh, 1 and 2. Uh, point being, nothing more than this, is, is that, man, we find within the, the Gospels, even, even Jesus addressing the woman in Samaria, you know, he goes to, to Jacob's well and he asks her, hey, draw up some water so that he can drink. And, and he ends up telling her that he has living water. And we find in the new earth, we find in the new Jerusalem, we, we find that right there in this, that what John is getting a, a, a vision of here is a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Anybody, uh, any, any water skiers, any people like boats, uh, fresh water stuff? Okay, one, two, anybody else? Three, four, five, we're going to start counting. Okay, you go up over here in the back. Awesome. I tell you. Some of, the, some of the coolest thing is, I can remember uh, being a, a, a kid, goodness gracious, I must have been 10 years old or so, and we would go down to uh, Lake Havasu over there in Arizona. And there's this, in Havasu, they have this bridge thing, the London Bridge, you know, it's just a replica or whatever. But there's portions of the water going all the way back into late 70s, early 80s, um, that, that you could look down and I was so fascinated as we would drive our ski boat through the channel, you know, just kind of putting there. And you're looking down, and they're, they're trashy fish, they're carp. But man, those suckers were huge. And to a little kid, being able to see down, I'm trying to throw rocks at them. I want to get a fishing pole and catch them and everything. Uh, here's the point, nothing more than this, is that, man, that, that, that water of life that is going to be flowing through the new city. Verse number two, he says this. He says, in the middle of its street... And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so the water of life moves into the tree of life. We have this here. Now, you will remember with me, uh, similar to what we covered here last week, that as we went backwards into Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, we, we remember at this point of time that the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden, and what did God do? Well, the scripture tells us that he drove man out of the Garden of Eden, that they lost access to the tree of life, right? And, and, and then he has an angel guarding that thing so that man couldn't touch it and live on forever in a sinful state. And so what do we see taking place here in Revelation 22 is, is that, that God restores access to the tree of life. And that is a beautiful, beautiful tree. It's got to be. Haven't seen it? I will one day. Uh, but what, what is lost at the fall of man is regained when Christ restores heaven and earth and everything. And so remember, gang, this is after the millennial kingdom, the 1,000-year the, the 
reign of Christ on this earth and everything. This is, this is after all of that. And so the tree of life. And so between the water of life, between the tree of life, listen, here's, here's the picture. Here's a very simple way to understand this. Just recognize that the saints of God will not lack any good thing. Just, just realize that, that, that what God has laid up and what God has prepared, even the Apostle Paul shared this, man, it, it, it blows our natural mind to try to think about these things. But if I could give you some, uh, if I could provide you just a little bit of, of shape of how to think about something in, in comparison to the world that you live in and that which lies ahead, let me give it to you in this way. Uh, middle of your Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, here's what Solomon says. Now, we know a few things about Solomon. We know that, um, you know, this is David's son. Uh, we know that, that the blessings that God put upon him were magnificent. We know that this guy was, was uh, he started off in a good capacity. God gave him wisdom. God gave him favor. God blessed his ability to build. Um, this, uh, the Lord made him richer than anybody that had come before him. And so, during the scope and the chorus of Solomon being blessed with all of that in an earthly capacity, he navigated through the pitfalls of life, trying to satisfy with material things the, 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 the longings that can only be reserved for God, the things that only that God can touch. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse number 13, it says this, Solomon, he pens, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. This is after all of Solomon's... Um, travels, discovery, investigating, searching out. He tried wine. He tried women. He tried working. He tried everything to feel that. And, and, and he says, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Watch. He says, fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all. And the idea in the Old Testament is nothing more than this. It's total satisfaction. That's it. So he tells us that. Now, as we spring forward back here into Revelation 22 and where we're at, we've had the uh, water of life. We've, we see the tree of life and all that. I just want you to think about it from this dynamic. And, and, and that is, is that the saints of God, once again, they're not going to lack anything good, okay? Whatever is, whatever is good is going to be there. God is in eternity, the new heaven, new earth and all of that. God is not taking away things Okay, and, and, and as we talked about last week, you know, Christians are not just going to be floating around on a cloud. We're, we're not going to be pinned up and isolated on our own little island and, and, and kind of live selfishly all to ourselves. No, God has a bigger plan than that. And I just want you to understand it from the vantage point of total satisfaction. So uh, moving on down, verse number three, he goes here. He says, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall, shall serve him. Very interesting one-liner right there at the end. The servants of God, they shall serve him. You know, I think that, again, I think that, that, that sometimes we think uh, that there's not going to be anything that is going to be happening in eternity, and that's not true. And why God is, has taken away the curse and everything is being restored, yet there still remains the aspect of work or service, and that work and that service is unto God. Now, 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 envision your life for just a second. Um, I, uh, I, I can only just, well, what can I say on this? I, I mean, I can only just try to help us to make believe, I guess, for just a second. But right now, because there's a curse upon the, the land, literally this started in Genesis 3 and 17, and we're still living under those particular things, okay? The struggle is real. The struggle with sin, the struggle with opposition, all of that is going to be out of the way. Now imagine that if you could work in such a way, like just go about your normal course of work and every bit of it would be blessed, how amazing would it be to live? <laughs> Even right now, right? right? I mean, there would there'd be no opposition. You'd have no bad days. You'd never get fired. You'd never get demoted. There'd never be a pandemic, right? You would just be working in, in, a, in a positive capacity. Well, now you can look ahead and apply that to what lies ahead in eternity in, in, in serving the Lord. There's going to be no opposition or retarding of that forward progress, if you will. Now, what's the limit? Where does it stop? I have no idea. I, does it ever stop? I, I don't think so. But we are going to serve him night and day. We're in, and there's no night. I guess we're going to serve him day and day and day all the time because he's illuminating, um, he's illuminating the world at that point. And so anyways, uh, moving on down. Verse number four. Here, here we go. 
He says this. He says, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, you may not like tattoos, but this one's going to be on your forehead. So you're going to look great with the tattoo on your forehead. Because it says his name's going to be on your forehead. You know, and I, I don't know that it's really a tattoo, but, but maybe we would pull it away by this. Maybe we would understand that we're identified as his. I, I, I love to define it this way. Like, uh, have, has anybody ever seen that movie, Toy Story, the kids' movie? Yeah, Toy Story. Okay, you know, um, uh, the guy with the cowboy hat. Woody, yes, the fellow with the cowboy hat right there. On the bottom of his boot, right? Andy, <laughs> okay? You know, what, what else do we take away? Um, you know, think about this. You know, in, in the time of, of just, and I'm generally speaking here, I know there's a lot of things that happen today, but generally speaking, okay, uh, a man and woman get married, and, and what happens in most of the cases? The woman ends up taking the man's last name, okay? And so if we could just understand that, that, uh, man, we're going to be identified as his. First Corinthians 13 and 12, it says this in part. He says, Paul says, he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. You will remember with me that the scripture tells us that no man in his humanity can see God and live. Uh, you'll remember with me even going back farther in the very beginning of the Bible, the book of Exodus with Moses right? That, that, that Moses wanted to see God face to face and God called him up on the mountain and still God did not allow him to see his face, but rather God shielded him, the scriptures tells us, put, hit him in the crack and, and he just, he just kind of saw the passing of God's Shekinah glory, if you will. He never saw him face to face. And yet in terms of what lies ahead, seeing God in all of his glory is something that's going to happen, that we will see God face to face in the new heaven, in the new earth, and that, that is, I, I don't even know what to think about that. Like I said, I can't even wrap my mind around these particular things. Uh, verse number five, he says, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. And so there it is, God's glory illuminating the holy city again as the light of life. So we saw uh, the water of life, the tree of life, and now we have the light of life. Uh, John 8 and 12, remember what Jesus said when he walked the earth. He says, I am the light of the world, that he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so just understand that, that a very simple message here just within these um, five verses so far, and that is nothing more than this, a simple message. It's all about Jesus. I think sometimes we, that we, we gather in churches or we gather in fellowships and, and, and we get the wrong impression that it's all about me. Well, what can you offer me? I'm here to, you know, for me. You know, what services, what programs, what are these types of things that you have? And that's, that's not what church is about, man. Church is about, uh, you know, spending time in worshiping Jesus. Church is about serving Jesus, which often comes by serving our neighbors and all that. And that, you know, just that, uh, that, that part of the Christian message is so often lost in translation today within, you know, some of the modern churches because, you know, people have become accustomed to eating these fast food diets, if you will. And the fast food diet is, it's all about consumerism Christianity. And, and, and we don't, we, we want to accurately open up the scriptures and, and, and why there's so many churches that are doing awesome things, we want to make sure that, that, that we understand God's heartbeat. And that is, is that the focus, it's all about Jesus. And that's it. And so, what else would we say? I would, I would add this. Uh, as I was reading through and kind of studying around um, this, I, saw, I came across something from Charles Spurgeon. It says this, or he said this. He says that we cannot imagine that a man's ambition is fixed on heaven if he has no heavenward thoughts or aspirations. Think about that for a second. Is that a slide that we, could, that we put up here? Take a look at that quote. If you have no thoughts at all about heaven, about the Lord in any capacity, there's no aspirations about that, then maybe the ambition or the drive of your life maybe is something that, that this final chapter in Revelation can address to have refocused. 
because we get so off course on these things and, 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 and man, I'm, I'm so guilty just like the next person. I was thinking about this today, you know, sitting next door in, in the office over there. You know, week by week, I get a chance to share with you guys on Wednesdays and on Sundays. And uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's just so cool to see what God is doing kind of as we move through this post-COVID time. But at the pace of which life is lived, I mean, I intentionally try to pull aside. And, and, and I'm taking hours and days in just the continuation of study always. But man. It feels like I never get enough time to do that that I'm called to do and do that which my heart longs to do. And, and, and yet I can think about my early days of walking with the Lord. Uh, in fact, Jody and I were sharing this with a, a younger couple here. Um, must have been at the end of last week. That we were so focused on us growing. We were so focused on you know, getting through college and, 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 and advancing within our career and raising our kids and, and, and making sure that we, you know, we were still doing those particular things and keeping our kids well adjusted to the world and giving them, you know, all, you know, certain privileges and all of these things. And I'm not old, but my kids are out of the house now. You know, I'm 30. I got a, uh, we have a daughter that's 32. We have a daughter that's 22. We got five grandbabies and all of this. We, we've, we've traveled a few uh, times, you know, through the course of life here, and I could recognize those things as as ambitions that weren't necessary of the Lord. That those were those were just the things of my own humanity, and and God was so gracious, and while He still blessed us, and He still allowed us to go forward. When we get to Revelation 22 and the final chapters, and even the final words that we're going to see in this particular chapter, please, folks. Please, church, remember that what Jesus is calling out is the proper perspective at any given time, place, or moment. That's what he's calling out. Why? Because at any point in time, the rapture of the church happens. And guess what? If you miss the rapture of the church, well, we studied through those chapters, chapters 6 through, uh, what is 17, 18, 19, right? We, we saw all of that dramatic elements that will fall upon the landscape of this of this world. Those are tough things. And as Spurgeon pens this out, that he can't imagine that a man's ambition is, is, that a man's ambition is fixed on heaven if he has no heavenward thoughts or aspirations. And in my younger days, as I've already mentioned, I think that, I, that, that, that taking and just thinking about what lies ahead, so very specifically what Revelation is teaching us about, I think that some of that stuff was, was not there. I can never remember sitting under another teacher going through and, and, and learning the book of Revelation and what a balance that it is to the totality of Scripture. And so, well, what do we do with it? Well, we keep moving. So idea number two is this, the final message, okay? Verses 6 down through 19, we're going to tackle these a little bit different. Uh, let me give you verse 6, though. He says this, he says, then he said to me, he says, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord... God of the holy prophets, he sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Now this is, uh, this once again, grab your Bible, flip back to chapter 1 for just a second, toggle between, uh, verse, um, toggle between chapter 22 and verse, <laughs> toggle between chapter 22 and chapter 1. There we go. Remember, at the very beginning, um, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, Things which must shortly take place, okay? That's where we had talked about it. We defined this, that, that when the return of Christ happens, it happens in a capacity that is, is sudden. It does not mean, as this was written in, in AD 95, right? John gave it. It does not mean that, okay, tomorrow, AD 96, that Jesus is coming. That's not what this means. But it does mean that when Jesus does come, that it's going to happen so fast Flip back to Revelation 22, Just take your eyes, scroll all the way down to verse number 11. Let me give you the principle here. He says that he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Here's the concept. Here's the idea. 
that because it's going to happen so suddenly, the return of Christ is going to, while we're aware of the conditions, we can see the heating up of the conditions and all this stuff. We know by way of world history, we know by keeping our eyes on the scripture, on Israel, we know that prophetically all the things that have been completed that need to happen for the return of Christ. And that we can see, Matthew 24, as we've already explored, all the falling apart of the different things between God dealing with the Jews, God dealing with the church, everything. That when this moment happens, there is no time to change your mind. So many times we think that, 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 and I'll just speak for myself, I'll throw myself under the bus. Before God radically saved me, I mean, I was inching along in my own thing. I knew about God. He was there in the back of my mind, but I didn't, listen, I, I didn't want to yield to God. And, and surely I've done that many bad times as a Christian as well. But, but, but what the scripture is indicating and in, in, in sharing with us here is that because it happened so, so rapid in a twinkling of an eye, there is no time to get right at that point. And, and, and his revelation points forward and, and, and even underscores the eminency of the return of Christ these are the things that you and I, in the love of Christ, can share with other people right now while we have a waking moment. Not a religion. It's not about religion, folks. It's not about doing more, performing more, and giving more. It's not about that. It's about knowing a person, and that, is, that person is Jesus. And so, uh, back to verse 6. You know, as we read this, you know, I think that, that many times that our natural tendency, you know, just like John here in this, you know, I, I, it's like, wait a minute. God's going to do What? You know, God's going to bring all of this stuff to pass, and, 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 and there's going to be this crazy water thing and, and this crazy tree thing like was in the Garden of Eden at the beginning of, of human history, and, and there's going to be just constant light, and man, all of this stuff is, oh, wait, what? Oh, I, I can't even begin to comprehend that. And so what does God do? I mean, he provides these words. He says, listen. She says, John, these words, these things, these words are faithful and they're true. And God has been showing his holy prophets over the course of time about this stuff. And so God gives him that assurance that every one of these words is certain. Maybe I can remind you of this. Take a look at the screen. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. This is also the apostle uh, John speaking here and writing. But he's writing in his epistle. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. What John gave to the believers in his epistle there was that assurance of faith. And what John is getting from God via an angel here is the same thing, that assurance of faith. John, you're putting your faith in me and you're listening to all of these things. You've gotten a vision. I've sent you out you know, to, to, to take note of these things and to write this stuff down and pass this out to the church. And you can be assured, John, that these things are certain and true and they're going to come to pass. And, and, and that is a great boost of hope when we focus on the goodness of God, when we focus on the promise of God, when we focus on that expectation, what it does is it lifts us out of our daily rut of routine. It lifts us out of the daily pressure and problems that we live in this fallen world. And God places us in a place as we set our mind upward that is above the things. And often he provides the strength for us to get through those obstacles, those pain points, the pressure, all of the problems that are about us by merely being mindful of what he has said. The scripture tells us here in the New Testament that we're to fix our mind on those things that are good and pure and lovely and praiseworthy. And, and man, there's a whole list of things that, that, that we're to focus on. But if you're like me or if I'm like you, man, I'm, I'm tethered. I mean, I have my iPhone, except for this past week because it broke. Uh, and I just got a new one today, but I haven't been able to get it all from the iCloud back to my phone just yet. Here's the point. That I'm always tethered to that thing. And I, I'm assuming that we all have the same pulse. We live in the same area. Man, my iPhone is going off all the time with all the crazy news that is there. And I, I, gotta, I gotta be honest, man. I get discouraged. I get frustrated. It's just hearing all this stuff. Give me some good news, man. You know, something more than, you know, Broncos are gonna do good in the next millennial. I don't know. You know something better than that. <laughs> You guys are tight tonight because you, you are, you're sitting there completely 
enthralled over this study. That's what it is. You're just so blessed by Jesus right now. Some of you are, and some of you are lying. You're in church. Don't do that. So, <laughs> uh, so the assurance of salvation, okay? The assurance of a restored paradise and state with God. Amazing. All right. And uh, verse number seven, here, here he goes. And we're going to pick it up because we're going we're gonna to start wrapping ourselves down here. Uh, Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And so, um, you know, if, if you were to tie this together with the end of verse number six shortly, and you would take a look here at what he says right here about quickly. Again, the, the, the whole texture, tone, flavor of this is, is it's suddenly, it's without delay. It's, it's watch, here's one amplifying word. It's by surprise. Okay. Did you get that? In, in other words, there is no time to have a second thought and go, oh, Lord, I was wrong. Oh, you, know, you know, okay. You know, and then somebody tries to come to faith in that particular moment. No, no, it's, it's too late. It's done. Okay, it's finished. You can be a tribulation saint at that point, right? Um, but, but, but that moment is sealed. And so Jesus says, again, the reminder, the encouragement, the exhortation, I am coming quickly. And the blessing is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Okay, he who keeps in, in, in light uh, or maybe I should say he who keeps a light touch on this world because of what he knows to be true. A light touch upon the world, right? You know, uh, Paul tells us that if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the desires or the cravings of the flesh. You know, you start throwing these Christianese stuff out there like that without opening up the flavor of those things. And, and, and sometimes if you're new to the faith, if you don't know Jesus or any of those things, you can get lost in, in just a sea of words but the only thing that God wants us to understand is, is that you want total satisfaction. It's above the current conditions in what you live within. And that was, that was something, you know, uh, uh, while it is true that I can share all of these things, and while it is true that people shared it with me before I became a Christian, I have to tell you that I heard their words, I heard their words, I heard their words, but until, until I personally knew the Lord, I, I, could, I could hear the words, but I just, I just couldn't understand what they were talking about. I'm going, man, what are you doing? That just seems so weird. But to receive God's grace, it has to be received by faith. You have to accept what he's offering by faith. And, and, and when you embrace that by repentance, changing your perspective, right? Repentance, it's, it's a change of perspective, and you respond to God. God shows you things and he gives you an understanding that just, it just blows your mind because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. These, you know, we could be good educated little students that sit in, in church and we can go through this and you can have all the greatest Bible verses memorized and, and all of these wonderful promises. But if it's not mixed with faith, the scripture tells us it prophesies nothing. There's, there's, it, it, doesn't do, it doesn't do you a heal of good, Nothing. It is to be mixed by faith, mixed with faith, and that is, is, is in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let's go a little bit farther. Take a look here, verse 10, he's, and he goes on, he says, and he said to me, he says, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. I find this totally fascinating. As we have uh, worked through the book of Daniel in some capacity here, as we've navigated through this Revelation study, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, and in Daniel chapter 12, verse 9, we find that when Daniel was given a prophecy, yet what he was also told by the angel is, is that he was to seal up the words of that prophecy because the time wasn't yet. Now, that was around 500 BC or so, and, and that was the instruction that he got. But what we find John getting here in AD 95 is something entirely different, and that is, is that the time is at hand. Okay, and, and, and because the time is at hand, it, he says, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, I pulled you guys as an audience here to see how many people had, had studied through the book of Revelation in previous churches or anything like that, and not many of you raised your hands. And, 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 and yet opening this thing up and studying this prophecy, the book of Revelation, is something that we're to do. We're not to seal it up. We're not to stay away from it. We are to explore it because there's a blessing that is attached for the person that is hearing and for the person that is, is reading it out and, and giving understanding, if you will, for the applications and what we can learn about what lies ahead. And so, very interesting just to see those, those two contrasts. And so... Uh, maybe I should say is, uh, are, you know, are you ready? 
Are, are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to meet him in the air? And so, um, well, let's go on. Let's, uh, let's make a wrap here. Verses uh, 11 down to 19. I'm just going to read it to you. Actually, I'm going to pick up in verse 12 because I already gave you 11. Jesus says, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He says, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the, the gates into the city. Uh, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Jesus speaks up again. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. He says, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Very, very, very simple in understanding this. We know that Jesus came to do what? To seek and to save the lost. John 3, 16, right? He didn't come into this world to condemn, but to seek and to save the lost. That's what he came to do. And, and, and why we live, gang, in this age of grace, and yes, it has been going on for some 2,000 years. That is true. And it's because God's patience is far greater than man's patience. It's because God dwells in eternity. And, and because he, he lives in eternity, you know, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day, right? You and I live in this time-space continuum here where it's, you know, we start at, you know, we start at our birth, right? And, and, you know, we get 40 years or 50 years or 60 or 70, 80, you know, whatever your, your time frame turns out to be. And, and, and because we're living so linear, if you will, and we look at the span of 2,000 years from a, a very human limited perspective, that, that we can think that, well, you know what? God has forgotten all about it. You know, this book is so unreliable, and yet that's precisely what was given in first century Christianity, that the time would come where the people would mock the scriptures, uh, specifically God's promises of returning the same way they did at his, his first coming, his first advent, right? Christ stepping out of heaven, putting on humanity, walking across the face of this earth and all that stuff, uh, you know, ministering to people and, and calling them to repentance and laying his life down. At, at Christ's second return, while it is, is, is spoken of probably in a much greater context, a, a much greater scope for his second coming, Yet people will get to that place just like our culture is right now is saying that, man, I've heard those promises forever. You know, it has been passed down. It's been in my family. It's been, you know, for longer than I can remember. And it's precisely what God has said would take place is that people would turn their back on God. And yet the very last chapter of the Bible, we find that he's still, you know, in, in, in the context of giving a, a prophecy to those that are alive still, you know, even in the church age here, that it's all about God's grace. He still wants people to come to him. He still wants people to receive that forgiveness of sin. He still wants to see people turn their life over to him and change direction and allow their thoughts to be transformed by the love of God and the promises of God. That's for you and I, gang, and that's for the people that will, uh, you know, that, that will accept that call of God upon their life. Final thing, verses 20 and 21, the, the culmination, the end of the scriptures. Here we are, end of the run, book 66, chapter 22, book 66, right? There's 66 books in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, okay? We're here, the very last two verses of the book of Revelation, idea, the last promise. Here's what he says. He says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. The idea is, is that, that you agree with what Jesus has said. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now here's that new word I told you we were going to learn, okay? It's an Aramaic word, okay? Uh, this is Maranatha. Some of you have uh, understand that word, have heard that word. You know, it's just nothing more than come Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha. Verse 21, it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that's how the Bible ends. And so in the closing aspect of this, the book of Revelation, this ending here, this final chapter and everything that we walk through in this chapter is just doing nothing more than emphasizing, watch, don't lose it, a readiness and a watchfulness 
that is to be practice, that, that, that the church has been given insight before these things take place, and God has shared with the church that church, this is where you're to be. This is specifically for the church, okay? Be ready and be watching. And, 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 and as the church is supposed to be fishers of men, that we are to make disciples, that we are to talk to others, we are to invite others, we're to get involved in other people's life. Yes, 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 yes. It's not for a religious thing. It's for a relationship thing, to be genuinely interested in somebody else, to be genuinely concerned to, to tell somebody else about Jesus. Hey, you can bring them to church if you like. You can point them online. Hey, you don't even, you could give them a Bible. You could tell them that you're praying for them. You know, whatever it is, just please be mindful of the aspect for those of you that are here in this room today, that, that if you're a Christian, that, that God wants you to finish on fire. He wants you to finish better than you started. He, he wants you to realize that what he's provided in the scriptures here is that the testimony of John, the testimony of the angels, the, the testimony of his very own word is, is that he's coming quickly. It's going to happen in such a way that even though human history has been some 2,000 years, it will take place in a, in a flash, in a moment. And there's no changing your mind once he moves and that happens. Right now, we're still in a moment of grace. We're still in a second of grace. But everything has been narrowing down, narrowing down, narrowing down, and being ready and being watchful, that is the practical lesson. The eminency of the return of Christ should lead the bride of Christ to be on the edge of her seat. Jesus gives an example within the Gospels of the 10 virgins. Five were ready, five were not, but they were all together. Five were ready, five were not. It'd be like a church, right? In, 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 a, in a fellowship setting, you know, there's, there's people that are like legit. I mean, they're legitimately following Jesus and they're in love with Jesus. And there's others that are doing Jesus things, but they're far from Jesus, right? The five, the five in, in the parable that Jesus gave, the five were ready and the five were not. You know, that, 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 that oil represents the working of God's Holy Spirit or being sealed by God's Holy Spirit. There, there are people that do religious things all the time, but they're, they're far from God. They don't know Jesus in any capacity, and they don't have the Holy Spirit, because if you had the Holy Spirit, that you can see the evidence of fruit coming out of the life. And then when we get on Wednesday, or we get on Sunday, primarily, I guess here in this fellowship, it happens on, on Sunday, because most of the time, Wednesday, you know, it's, a, it's an audience of believers that is here. But maybe we should close tonight in this way of, of you know, killing the festoon lights. In fact, let's just do that, okay? And, 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 and I'll, I'll make a wrap of the message here. But man, I'm gonna be up here with a big old fat deep sea pole and, you know, let's go fishing, man. You know, and, 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 and maybe the fishing is, is that I turn you loose and you go out there and go fishing. Yeah, that's even better, right? You know? But the Bible ends here which with Jesus's grace being commended to all the saints and the takeaway from the entirety of, that, of this book one more time is to live a life that is ready and is expecting the return of Jesus at any moment. And when we live that way, gang, the decisions that we make in a moment-by-moment -moment context turn out to be much different. God does not want us to make these decisions based off of fear. He doesn't want us to, 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 to move in a place of, of relating to him by way of that. Yes, a reverence for sure. He's a holy God. He deserves that, that reverence. But the scriptures tell us that perfect love casts out fear. We are not responding to God in such a way as that, oh, if I don't do this, God's going to take my legs out. No, 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 man. That, 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 that's not gospel truth right there. You know, what that is, 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 is it's a mixture of humanity and, and, and bad Bible teaching. It, it's not that at all. It's the grace of God that brings us to repentance. It's the love of God that brings man to repentance. And so, uh, once your Bibles are closed, if you'll stand to your feet with me here tonight. And uh, as is our, our custom, uh, we'll pray. Um, and then, um, just remember, I think I told you I'd mention this at the end of service. Um, this, is, this is the last Wednesday night. This is the last midweek here through the course of summer. For the next eight weeks, starting next week, uh, we're going to be at, at Church in the Park right over here. Uh, behind the Weston Hotel, uh, Mid-City Park there. Uh, and we'll be gathering there, same time, starting at 6.30. And um, uh, watch your emails. If you're not signed up for emails, get them or check on the app. Um, but 
there will also be context of, uh, I don't want to, I don't like the word potluck because that sounds so old. So I'm going to say barbecue, even though barbecues are right, like not going to be there. But, but <laughs> I'm trying to get around a word. Yeah. Bring food for others. There you go. So, buffet. Okay. We're going to Cracker Barrel, folks. No, no, no. <laughs> um, listen. God's love for you is so perfect and unchanging. I can't stress that enough to you. I know that many times we don't feel worthy of God's love. And listen, I'm, I'm speaking as a sinner, just like the rest of, this, of those of you that are hearing my voice right now. But it's absolutely true. He knows you. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We read that tonight. He knows. He knows everything about who you have been, who you are right now, and even the failures that are going to come tomorrow and for whatever remainder of our lives that we get. They're going to be there. We're going to blow it. But we are safe in the love of Christ. And, and, and this readiness and everything that comes out of, of Revelation 22 is, is to point us back in this direction so we would understand the assured, assurance of the faith that we have, the eminency of Christ's return, and then the response is nothing more is, is than, man, I live in that ready state. I live in a state that is dependent upon God, and I'm not entangled with the things that dull my heart towards God. And that's the warning here. Because again, I don't know. I, I, I presume that I'm, I'm talking to mostly Christians or all Christians in this room, maybe. I just want to stir your affections back towards Jesus that you will remember that Christ is coming again for his church. And if there's anything that is in the way and you're struggling in any capacity, you're wrestling with sin within your life, I'm encouraging you, let somebody else know. You know, the elders and, and, and maybe a pastor will be up front here. Man, they'd love to talk to you and pray with you and encourage you in some capacity or get with some of your small group people or your men's ministry or women's ministry. Share it with somebody so they can pray for you, so they can build you up and encourage you and help you to go forward and not fall back. Does that make sense? All right. Father, I, we, we pray tonight. We're thanking you for what you've given to us. And um, uh, before we go our way here tonight, uh, we just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you that you are faithful from beginning to end. Thank you that you will complete what you started within us. Thank you that as you have told us in your word, Romans chapter 8, that nothing can separate us from your love and that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus that are not walking according to the flesh. There's no condemnation. Thank you for that. And I'm praying over this body of believers that are present and for those that are perhaps even still watching online this moment praying and I'm asking for a move of your Holy Spirit to bring men and women to repentance, that you would help people to get right with you. You'd help us to get right with you, God, so, so that we would not be ashamed at your appearing. So bless your people as they go their way. And we're also, we're also asking for next week as we kick off church in the park, uh, we're asking, um, well, Lord, that you be with us in the park setting. It's always so fun to do this in the park. Um, but, but may you continue to bring us a good word. We ask this by faith in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said,